Welcome to this short video. Uh, my name's Alan Deerling. Um, I'm an author, publisher, and been freelancing in that area for nearly 30 years. I'd like to tell you a wee bit about my new novel, Friendly Invasion, as the GIs trained for D-Day. As you can guess from that, it's set 1943-44, and the action in it takes place around the southwest of England. When I first was, became aware of some of the stories, I'd met John Fowles, the author of French Lieutenant's Woman and uh, The Magus and other books. And he was the honorary volunteer curator of Lyme Regis Museum. And we swapped some articles, we swapped uh, some photos and various material. And he told me about how over two million Americans had been based in the Southwest during the build-up to D-Day, and he gave me access to a small amount of the museum's collection, and I became intrigued. Fast forward to about 1990, and I'd moved down to Lyon to live full-time there, and I was in a pub called The Ship, and um, a chap was talking to me, and he said, my father, he was a police sergeant when the riot took place in Lyon. OK, my author's antennae popped up and I thought, well, oh, there's a story here. And I thought, well, I did social history at university and I did sociology. And social history is a good way of finding out what happened and sociology helps you understand why it happened. And I thought I could, I could write something about this. So I interviewed over um, 30 of the locals and some American GIs got depositions and um, delved into the various stories and I found very quickly that I couldn't write a social history and I couldn't write it because imagine there's a car crash and there's five people witness that car crash and the police quickly find that they've got five versions of the truth and that's what I was finding. I had lots and lots of stories and I was getting at least five versions of every story. So move on again to very recently, and I decided, well, I've got these 200 books now about um, when the Americans were in England training for D-Day, and I've got all these interviews. I really need to bring this story into the top of my pile and get down and write it. So I wrote it as a drama documentary. I wrote it fact and fiction brought together. I think they call them a faction now. And I wrote it very much with the idea of perhaps, just perhaps, it might be good for becoming a TV or a film. So it's written in episodes, so in stories inside the main story. My main characters are the American GIs and locals and evacuees. Indeed, some of the girls who are evacuees and are, uh, Joe and Ruth, um, they get to know the American GIs very well. One becomes a girlfriend of one of them, and that's a main part of the story. To give you a flavour of what goes on in the book, I'd like to do a short reading from when the Americans have been in the town for a period of time. I have to set the glasses off for this. We're in the Dolphin Inn uh, with a couple of locals I've called Jim Howden and Jack Wedlock. It's an American town now, muttered Jim, supping ale from one of Lady Landlady Bowditch's tankards. You're right there, Jim. There must be over a thousand of them round here. You knows I work at cinema, and we gets more dollars there now than pounds, shillings and pence. They're great moviegoers, and on their wages they can afford to go whenever they want. Jack replied, lighting another American camel cigarette. But a lot of them do brag and show off. When I told one white GI, the old one, about them being overpaid, oversexed and over here, he snapped straight back at me, saying the Brits are underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. From the next table, bespectacled Ivy joined in the conversation. I've been working up there naffy in the Marine Theatre, and all I can say is that we find the coloured fellas are much nicer to deal with. They're real courteous with a natural charm. Me, I'd rather have, rather serve a regiment of dusky lads than a couple of the white troops we've got now. Ivy's companion, Chip, Edith, chipped in. 
I work alongside Ivy and I've been walking out with one of the coloureds, Eugene. He's only 20, but he's a right gentleman. Calls me his Duchess. But when we came out from the cinema last week, a group of white GIs came over and a big southern state sergeant yelled at Eugene. What are you black bastard doing on sidewalk? They took a swing at Eugene, knocked him down and another booted him in the ribs. Eugene shouted at him, Hey Sarge, I'm an American. And the sergeant yelled back, You're a chicken shit nigger. You'll always be a nigger. Luckily, some of our local chaps came to the rescue and the white GIs backed off. Afterwards, Eugene said to me, he just couldn't win. He told me, if I'd have stumbled on a brick, they'd have said I was drunk and beat me up for that. I fear there's going to be real trouble sometime. <coughs> what we've got there is the makings of that trouble. The white troops were 90% of the total that Roosevelt sent over to train for D-Day. And in this book, what I've done slightly unusually is put in superscript numbers in the text and then link them to notes at the back of the book. So here's one of the notes, note five. From 1940s onwards, President Roosevelt had imposed a target of 10% blacks in the army in each theatre of operation and he insisted that the same apply to the US Army in Britain. Churchill's Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, had told the American Ambassador Winant that the British climate is badly suited to Negroes. But the black troops arrived, and the question of whether to adopt the American colour bar and segregation in Britain was raised in the House of Commons, where Churchill said that he hoped, without any action on my part, the points of view of all concerned will be mutually understood and respected. The reality was that a set of double standards was adopted, with the War Office covertly supporting the US Army segregation policy without publicly acknowledging the fact. During the Cabinet discussion on the issue, Lord Cranbourne, the Colonial Secretary, reported that one of his own black officials had been barred from the regular restaurant for fear of offending the US officers. Churchill is reported to have replied, if he takes a banjo with him, they'll think he's one of the band. I don't want to spoil your enjoyment of hopefully reading my book, so I'm not going to tell you too many of the stories. Suffice it to say that some of them are not very nice. There were fights, there was rape, there were many US soldiers and British soldiers and Canadian soldiers killed in friendly fire while they trained. At Slapton Sands in Devon, they say over 200 died on the beaches from friendly fire and another 750 American GIs died in Exercise Tiger when they were training for an amphibious landing and the German e-boats intercepted their radio messages and managed to kill that number, 750 bodies were washed up as far away as Portland and Weymouth, and the morale dropped tremendously. But in amongst it all, there were lighter moments. There was fun. The Americans brought their sports, the three Bs, uh, baseball, basketball, and boxing. And they loved them, and they wanted to show off, and so they put on exhibitions. I've got the story of one of those in the book. They also, like many of their British compatriots, they lived for the moment, and so did the girls and the young women of the South West. The for, more, for tomorrow you might die ethos was alive and well in 1943 and 44, and people didn't behave the same as they had done before and after the war. Times were changing, and the behaviour patterns did too. There was more VD, there were more babies born out of wedlock and whilst many people in the southwest got to know and love uh, the black troops, the coloureds as they call them, while they were here, the American whites, many of them hated their Negroes. They, wouldn't, they weren't allowed to bear arms, they weren't allowed to fight alongside them. 
They called themselves KPs. They were regarded as KPs, kitchen porters. They did the carrying, they did the driving, they dug the trenches, but they did not fight alongside the, the white GIs. Anyway, that's a taster of the book, and I hope you enjoy reading it yourselves. Thanks for listening.